Welcome to Episode 6 of Police News TV for the first week of March 2012. Hello, I'm your host, Paul Ballmer. On this week's broadcast, two cops, two separate shooting incidents with one common lifesaver. LAPD chief and LASD sheriff back driver's licenses for illegal aliens. 16-year-old robs two banks via the drive through Five arrested in connection with the Washington State Trooper's death. These and more police news stories and our ever-popular Dumb Criminals segment. You're in the right place with us here on Police News TV, your new source for national law enforcement news by cops for cops. Getting right into this week's top stories, Kentucky and New York officers protected by their gear in shootings. This week, two uniformed officers at two separate agencies were protected from serious injury by two different pieces of gear. On February 24th, Louisville, Kentucky Metro Police Officer Lamont Washington responded to a home invasion call when he was shot in the chest in hand by a suspect. The police badge Officer Washington was wearing actually deflected one of the bullets. That, combined with the fact that he was wearing a protective vest, kept his injuries from being much worse. Three suspects, 19, 18, and 17, were taken into custody, but police have not said which of these suspects is the alleged shooter. In the second incident, on February 27th, NYPD officer Thomas Richards and his partner approached a suspicious person on the street. The person, Louis Martinez, 25, then shot at the officer, and a running gun battle ensued. While Martinez shot at the officers three times, Officer Richards was struck only once, but that round was stopped by the ammo clip on his duty belt, again saving this officer from serious injury or death. Officer Richards was also wearing his ballistic vest. Hello, I'm your co-host Jill Adrian, and here are some more news stories. Injured Memphis cops being sent back to duty, Memphis, Tennessee. The Memphis Police Union is raising concerns that the city is sending officers injured in the line of duty back to the streets too soon. Mike Williams, president of the Memphis Police Union, has stated in published reports that he is noticing that the officers who are injured and evaluated by a city doctor are sent back to active duty with restrictions like no shooting, don't wear your bulletproof vest, and no running. Normally, these injured officers would be placed on desk duty until they were fully healed. However, Williams says that he feels the city's workman's comp insurance carrier is pushing the cops back on the street with injuries so the city can save money on overtime. A Memphis City Councilman has called for an investigation of this issue. Connecticut police draw fire over license plate scans. Hartford, Connecticut. Many of you are now familiar with the new automated license plate scanners used on police cruisers around the country. If you're not, a police car is equipped with special cameras that see and recognize license plates of cars that come within range of the cruiser. The scanners automatically read passing cars' license plates and then query motor vehicle and criminal national databases. If there's a problem with a car's plate, the system then alerts the officer so he or she can take action. Well, a group of police agencies in Connecticut have linked the historical license plates data obtained by each of these specially equipped cruisers and stored it in their own database containing some 3.1 million records of when and where the plates were scanned, dating back to 2011. The database is searchable and specific records can be viewed by the public. Well, this has raised concerns with the group you may know as the American Civil Liberties Union. They feel that this archive database open to the public would allow anyone to figure out where someone works or when they leave for work. You could use the person's travel to deduce whether they're a churchgoer or attend a political rally or an AA meeting, said David McGuire, an attorney for the ACLU of Connecticut. However, the president of the Connecticut Chiefs of Police Association, Douglas Fuchs, said that use of this archive data has already led to the solving of several serious crimes, including recovering stolen cars, not to mention the issuance of numerous tickets for expired tags. Additionally, according to Fuchs, if you have never stolen a car, if your registration is up to date, the license plate reader will never know you exist because it's comparing you to a database that you're not in. The ACLU wants state legislation that would allow police to keep the data for only two weeks and which would restrict access to members of law enforcement only. 
Chief Uke said he would oppose time limits on storing the information. If police develop a suspect in a string of crimes, the data could be used to help link that person to the location and times where past crimes occurred. David McGuire said that the ACL's use concern is misuse of the technology. Hero Stady pulls truck driver from Fall River Highway wall of flames. At Police News TV, we encourage our viewers to submit interesting stories to us so that we can share them with our audience. This story was submitted by one of our viewers named Jay. A Massachusetts trooper recently saved the life of an unconscious man whose truck struck a bridge support and burst into flames. Trooper Allison Powell came upon the accident on February 19th and saw that the truck, as well as the area around it, was engulfed in flames. She quickly rescued the driver from the cab and dragged him through a wall of flames to safety. In fact, the fire was so intense, it actually melted the bridge's support beams. The truck driver is in stable condition at the hospital, and the heroic trooper was uninjured. But that's not the whole story. Massachusetts State Police Trooper Allison Powell performed that same act of heroism two years ago when she rescued another driver from a burning car. Great job, Trooper Powell. Pressure builds for police, civilian drone flights, and FAA regs. Many law enforcement agencies are looking into obtaining surveillance drone aircraft so they can fight crime more efficiently. These remotely operated drone aircraft are used heavily by the military in countless missions. However, currently these drones cannot be used in the skies of the U.S. without case-by-case -case special authorization by the FAA. This is because of a concern that these remotely operated aircraft could cause interference or mid-air collisions with the normal aircraft. The U.S. Congress has told the FAA that it must allow these drones to fly in civilian airspace by September 2015. This spring, the FAA will take the first step in setting up rules of operation for these drones, and they will pick six areas in the U.S. for testing of the new rules. According to Dale Wright, head of the National Air Traffic Controllers Association Safety and Technology Department, controllers want drone operators to be required to have instrument-rated pilot licenses which is a step above a basic private pilot license. Several police departments are experimenting with smaller drones to photograph crime scenes, aid searches, and recon for SWAT teams. The Justice Department has four drones it loans to police agencies. LAPD Chief and LA County Sheriff backs driver's license for illegals. Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles Police Chief Charlie Beck and then a day later, Los Angeles County Sheriff Lee Baca supported giving driver's licenses to illegal immigrants as a way to increase safety on the roads. In an interview by the LA Times on February 22nd, the LAPD chief said the licenses would also help officers identify those they encounter at motor vehicle stops and accident scenes. According to Chief Beck, the license could be a provisional license, it could be a non-resident license. Beck also acknowledged that state officials would have to find ways to address widely held concerns that offering licenses to people in the country illegally could make it easier for terrorists to go undetected. How do you feel about this? Post your opinion on our Police News TV Facebook page and let us know. In our weekly segment featuring a worthy cause for law enforcement, it's a seldom talked about but very real threat to police officers and it's the subject of a documentary about law enforcement post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. A police officer's wife along with her producing partner Lisa Edwards are trying to raise money to move this powerful and important documentary from script to production to release. The movie explores the untold side of law enforcement as it documents the stories of officers and their families who are now suffering the mental anguish of the careers they chose, which has led some to suicide. Deborah Louise Ortiz, who is one of the executive producers and wife of a 22-year law enforcement veteran, tries to expose the reasons why 15 to 18 percent of all cops have PTSD just from doing their jobs. She said, it saddens me to know how little our society knows about the struggles these brave men and women face during their years on the job and must carry with them into what should be their hard-earned, joyful retirement. What I find infuriating is how little the departments themselves do in order to help these men and women. This cannot continue. Their voices have to be heard in honor of those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice of suicide. They already have raised their goal of $25,000 to continue filming the documentary, but it's going to take more money to finish it. 
She set up a Kickstarter fund to accept donations for this worthy endeavor to help our own. Look for it at kickstarter.com and search for the keyword Code 9 Officer Needs Assistance. There you'll see a brief video trailer of the documentary or go to her website dangerouscurves.com to read the full story about the movie. Please help them so that they can help our comrades. In the calendar segment of our show, the International Police Mountain Bike Association will be holding its 22nd annual conference this year in St. Paul, Minnesota. The conference runs from April 28th through May 2nd. The conference will offer certification courses, dozens of information-rich, cutting-edge, practical, and classroom-based workshops, a colorful expo hall to explore, and new friends and old with whom to meet and achieve your personal skill development goals. Check out their website, ipmba.org, for more details. In our Dumb Criminals segment, man arrested for making own cheeseburger and fries at Denny's, Madison, Wisconsin. On February 21st, a man wearing a coat and tie walked into a local Denny's, identified himself to the local manager as the 30-year corporate manager from the restaurant chain. James Summers, 52, told the local store manager that, in fact, he was there to replace her as the store manager. The local manager, being quite surprised by this sudden change of events in her career, went back to her office to call Denny's corporate headquarters to find out what the heck was going on. While the local manager was busy on the phone, the new manager went behind the grill and made himself a cheeseburger, french fries, poured himself a refreshing soda. Once things were confirmed by corporate that there was no new manager, the Madison police were called. Upon arriving at the scene, the police confronted Mr. Summers and found a stun gun and a few crack pipes on him. As police were leading the arrested would-be new manager out of the restaurant, Mr. Summers shouted, This is why you don't dine and dash, kiddies. Okay. Hey, hey, I know. Maybe this is an opportunity for Summers to manage the mess hall at county jail. <laughs> Teen Rob Banks by drive through Orem, Utah. A 16-year-old began his felony crime spree early in life on February 25th. You see, the boy took his mother's car without her permission and drove to the local Central Trust Bank. He pulled up to the drive-up teller window and passed a note to the bank teller, which said, in part, that she should give him money and implied that he had a weapon. The bank teller complied with the boy's demands, and as he drove away, the bank called the Orem police to report the incident and give the getaway car's description. Before the police could locate the half-pint bank robber, he did the same thing at another local bank. A short time later, police located the car that the junior John Dillager was driving, parked in a nearby neighborhood. After spotting the 16-year-old bank robber walking up the street and confronting him, the boy was cooperative and told the truth as to the events of this mischievous day. Police recovered an undisclosed amount of the bank money, but no weapon was found. The boy's mother was at work at the time of the incidents and had no idea what had happened. The teen was taken to juvie and faces two counts of armed robbery, a second-degree felony. The county attorney will determine whether the teenager will be charged as an adult. I think this boy will be getting a long time out. Massachusetts officer shot by sergeant is improving. Beverly, Massachusetts. We're happy to report that Officer Jason Lantich of the Beverly Police Department is recovering well, but still in the hospital after being shot multiple times by a police sergeant from a neighboring town. On February 29th, Hamilton Police Sergeant Kenneth Nagy had a prearranged meeting with Officer Lantich outside a North Beverly Starbucks coffee house. Then, for yet unknown reasons, Sergeant Nagy shot Officer Lantich twice. It's also unknown why the two men were meeting. Sergeant Nagy then fled the scene, only to return just five hours later when he committed suicide in his car in the parking lot before police could intervene. The entire incident is under investigation by the Essex District Attorney's Office. Five arrested in connection with Trooper's death. Seattle, Washington. Last week we told you about the tragic death of Washington State Trooper Tony Radulescu, who was shot during a motor vehicle stop by Joshua Blake, an ex-con with a history of antagonizing police. That story broke just as we were taping last week's show, so we had limited information at the time. Since then, we've learned that later the same day of Trooper Radulescu's murder, as the SWAT team was closing in on Blake's girlfriend's house, where the cop killer was hiding out, Blake committed suicide. Further investigation into the events following Trooper Radulescu's killing have revealed that after Radulescu's death, 
Blake called his girlfriend, Jesse Lee Foster, to pick him up, telling her that he had done something bad. She then took him to her house to hide and planned to get him out of the area later, according to Sheriff Sergeant Ken Dickinson of the Kitsap County Sheriff's Office. Foster was arrested, along with four others this week, all for assisting Blake after his shooting of the trooper. One of the arrestees, an 18-year-old woman, was in Blake's vehicle when Trooper Radulescu stopped him. Chicago officer dies of a heart attack while on duty. A 25-year veteran of Chicago PD passed away on February 27th as he succumbed to a fatal heart attack while on patrol. Preston Ross Jr. was 48 years old and had received 17 departmental awards during his career. Officer Ross is the 21st line of duty death this year. Monticello officer dies behind the wheel. Police officer Zane Perry of the Monticello Police Department in Georgia suffered a fatal heart attack while driving his patrol vehicle on February 25th. He was a part-time police officer with the agency and he was 43 years old. He is survived by his wife and two children. He's the 22nd officer to pass away while performing his duties. We here at Police News TV would like to thank you for watching. The Police News TV weekly show is by cops for cops. We try to bring our fellow law enforcement officers a quality and entertaining as well as informative weekly broadcast. The weekly show becomes available every Friday for you and for others to watch. So please spread the word of our show to other fellow officers so they too can enjoy it with their families. Also, you can like us on Facebook, watch and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter. We have many other ways to watch and listen to this broadcast. Go to our website, policenewstv.com, to watch the show and for internet links on the stories from each of our weekly episodes. If you wish to submit a news story, you can email us at contact at policenewstv.com or call us at 727-437-2207. We value your input. We do. This show is dedicated to Chicago Police Officer Preston Ross Jr. and Monticello Police Officer Zane Perry. Let's keep them and their families, as always, in our thoughts and prayers. So, until next time, to all our brothers and sisters in blue out there, stay safe and see you next Friday on Police News TV, where we've got you covered. All right, that's it. Let's roll. Hey, 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 hey! Let's be careful out there.